Hi, this is E-Rock with Fanboy Films, and tonight I've got a very special installment of the Late Night Saga because this is a special occasion. And so, for the very first time, I have a guest with me. She's the daughter of someone I've talked about here on the channel many times. News anchor turned late night talk show host. Of course, I'm talking about the one and only Tom Snyder. So now, via the magic of internet color cast, if you will, all the way from Jose Ignacio, Uruguay, please help me welcome Anne Marie Snyder. Hey there, E Rock. What's going on? Tell us, today is October 15th, 2023. What is so special about this date? Well, what's so special about this day is 50 years ago, right about now, The Tomorrow Show, starring Tom Snyder, aired for the very first time from Burbank, California. I don't know why anniversaries get this way, but the executives, they all send us champagne, and they send us letters, and they send us checks, and they send us telegrams and wires, and you say, hey, this is really an important day because you've been on the air for so long. Every year we have an anniversary. We used to have anniversary parties, but there have been budget cuts here. 1973, you were pretty young when the show started. Is that right? Very young. So you barely walking. <laughs> barely walking. So you knew that Dad was, you, did you know Dad was a news anchor? He was on TV? Did you have some awareness of what your dad did for a living? I knew that he was on TV, but I didn't know about the Tomorrow Show because I was very, very young. And that came on at a time when I was sleeping. So when right. I was, when it first came on, I didn't know. When I started to become a teenager and became a punk rocker and he had all these bands on that I was dying to see, then I knew exactly what it was. Who were some of the bands? I think they said U2 had its very first American debut on the show. Next up from New York, the electrifying band from Ireland called U2, now completing a tour of the United States where their first album, Boy, has been a critical success. Was it planned for you to go up the stairs like that? Because usually our camera crews get very nervous when guys step out of the light. We can't see you when you're not in the light. Can you think of any other bands that you were really into? That... Yes. Actually, one of my favorite bands, The Clash, debuted on that show. Um, the Ramones also did. You know, you know. A lot of groups, all they come into the business yes. for is to make a lot we of money and to fans, hell with the right? Yeah, but we used to be fans. them, right? And so, you know. like, we haven't forgotten what it's like. All the other groups have forgotten what it was like. So they're all too we busy. know that one day we will return and become nothing again, you know? <laughs> How do you make certain that you'll keep this attitude? Because I've had a lot of people come through here in the last eight years that say much the same as you're saying, and then the minute have they you make... you been here for eight years? Yeah, it's hard to believe the way I do it, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something, Joe. I've had him fool for a long time out here. Okay. We are not going to be able to control this trip tonight. I can feel that coming. The Ramones are hard driving punkers. So when you're 20, 24 hours to go, I want to be so I'm not the to do nowhere to go. I want to be so that was a great you know, right. Right. <laughs> What do you want to argue with him about? Anything. <laughs> okay, well, I'll argue with you about something. I, I loved your number, but I couldn't understand a word you said. Did it, did, do you yeah. people... We don't sing words, just sounds. That particular show had a guest host, which is Kelly Lang, who was a very, is and was, a very dear friend of my father's and was his co-anchor at KNBC. So fun fact for your viewers, when Tom couldn't do the show, he would call on Kelly to come and sit in. Tom Snyder, I could go on forever. Uh, <laughs> Tom was great fun. The other band that came on first was Joan Jett from Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. 
Phil Collins when he was a single artist. His right. first time out was there. Of course, the famous interview with Johnny Rotten, which when he was a part okay. of Public Image and refused to talk about the Sex Pistols. Because the Sex Pistols was going to be the absolute end of rock and roll, which I thought it was. Unfortunately, the majority of the public, being the senile animals that they are, got that wrong. Too bad. The moment that's interesting is when Dad says... I'll find a way to your heart somehow and gives him a cigarette and he has that cigarette. And then all of a sudden he kind of chills out for a little bit. Can I have a cigarette again, please? Um, yeah, if you'll just- This won't cause an argument. Yeah. No, of course not. But you told me all the things that your music is not, but you didn't tell me what it is. I don't know what it is. Oh, well, that's probably the reason why you didn't. They go toe to toe on that one. And it's, it's fun to watch my dad knowing his personality, like, how he probably just wanted to jump across the table and slap that kid, you know, <laughs> he just, he still, he afforded him the dignity of sitting there and, you know, just going through it. Yeah. I think he says something like, um, we'll be right back with this fascinating interview or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Excuse me for talking while you were interrupting. I have to do a couple of commercials here. We'll Humor me. Continue, uh, not for long, with this fascinating discussion right after these announcements. Isn't this fun, gang? Who else broke on that show? Oh, Wendy O. Williams of the Plasmatics. First time out. So we like yeah. to call... Well, they, they blew up a car on his set, right? I remember him saying that was, it was loud and obnoxious. It was a And John Chancellor gave them a jingle jangle from the newsroom below because it reverberated through the whole building. So that was, <laughs> that was quite a spectacle. You know, in Studio 3K, they come in there with a Pinto or a Mustang and they blow this sucker up in the middle of the John Chancellor news. Now the news guy comes down. He says, what's going on down here? I said, well, we're just blowing up a car. I mean, nothing unusual about that, is there? Pretty much every punk rock band that you can think of, dad was kind of the, the godfather of punk rock on the airwaves, akin to a man named Rodney Bingenheimer, who ran a show called Rodney on the Rock. He would break all the bands like Blondie, Adam Ant, all those kinds of bands um, on his show. And I lived in California, so I'd listen to the radio. And then my dad would end up having these punk rock bands on the show. So that was kind of a mind blow. Rock and roll people play great music. But it was always my view that by the time it got to the home viewer in those days, it's on a speaker like this, which has absolutely no range, no highs, no lows, just flat, loud mm -hmm. noise coming out of a small speaker. I didn't feel that the rock and roll audience, who by this time was sophisticated enough to listen on FM stereo, would want to listen to it on television. But you must have been underestimating your own appeal or the appeal of your show because this is pre-MTV. It's pre-cable television. And other than the curiosity pop on the Ed yeah. Sullivan show or maybe a little thing on American Bandstand, these guys had no mainstream access. You gave it to them. True. Uh, people couldn't see the, the Grateful Dead or Elton John even that often. John, murder me. I beg us. You don't murder me. Please don't murder me. I, I read a story somewhere with you, and you can tell me if this is uh, true or not, or uh, maybe you don't want to talk about it, but um, the story was that you were backstage at the Tomorrow Show, and one of the bands invited you to, to their concert or something, and your dad kind of said, hey, she's too young. No. Is that true? Yes. That is absolutely true. That oh was my God. Stan you... Lynch, who was the drummer of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. He thought it would be fun to have me come to the show in Madison Square Garden. I think he wanted to do more than have me watch the show. <laughs> and he produced these tickets and a pass to the limo. And my dad was kind of over on the other side of the room and he got wind of this and came running over and he said, she's, I can't swear on the show, so, but it begins with F and ends with G. 15 years old, no thank you. Anybody <laughs> want to go see Petty? And like, <sighs> Everybody. All the PAs were like, yes, we want to go. So, yes, that <laughs> happened. Our thanks to you and the fellas for being here as you start this tour. I appreciate your stopping by here. Okay. And Tom and the, and the Heartbreaks are so concerned. Heartbreakers. The Heartbreakers. Yeah. Earth. 
So even though you didn't, uh, you were too young to watch the Tomorrow Show because it was on so late. Uh, you seem to be. You seem to. I guess you were behind the scenes once or twice. In this picture here, you are with the uh, director of The Tomorrow Show, is that right? That's Joel Tater. He was the original director of The Tomorrow Show. The other fun fact for the viewers might be that Joel was actually the news director at KNBC prior to becoming the producer slash director of The Tomorrow Show. I was directing Tom uh, on that newscast. And he called me into the office one day and he said, guess what, I, I'm gonna get this late night show that they're doing. I said, really? He said, yeah, it's gonna to be tomorrow's show. And, and uh, he said, uh, I'd like you to direct it. And I said, oh, that'd be great. He said, it's gonna be on from one to two in the morning. And I thought, no way is this ever gonna work. The night that I was born, Joel was at the hospital and he was the second one to hold me after my dad. We uh -huh. love Joel. I've been working on a project that's brought me into contact with, as an adult woman now, with a lot of the stuff I didn't see prior. So I've been kind of going down the rabbit hole like everybody else and finding out about my dad and kind of what the whole situation was with the show and the topics and, you know, all of the things that he talked about way back in the 70s, which were taboo subjects that he brought to national consciousness. Uh, we're not entirely certain why this upheaval occurred in American history, but it was a time when sex and music and drugs all came together and had a powerful impact on society, on our attitudes about sex, about morals, and about ourselves. And we'll look at all of that with the Grateful Dead here tonight. You know, he brought the, the abortion topic up, uh, had some guests on six months after the Roe versus Wade. He had the first transsexual ever on homosexual, those kinds of things. Most of us who are beyond 40 can remember that time in the early 1950s when the then George Jorgensen shocked the world by announcing uh, that uh, he had become Christine Jorgensen, one of the first people to undergo a sex change operation, certainly the first one to have it so widely publicized. I've spoken with over 200,000 students in the last seven or eight years, and I've never felt put on by them, ever, ever, ever. But they'll ask me the most direct questions. What do they want to know from you? Well, they want to know how it felt. Yeah. Uh, how did I confront it? Uh, by today's standards, they, they're not surprised by it. Uh, transsexual and transgender and so forth. If it hits the 18th page of the newspaper, or at all hits the newspaper, uh, it's a miracle. It's a thing that it took some 30 years to evolve. And less than 30, I would say 20 years. The last 10 years have been really quite easy. As long as you brought it up, I mean, I think you've talked on the radio before about sexuality. Mm. You know, there are some, uh, yeah, without, yeah. and I'm trying to make this sensitive and sensible. There are many people who do not live in New York or Los Angeles, these free swinging bastions of liberal thought, who are extremely put off by any deviation from the norm. So when you make a comment about yourself or anybody else, do you ever wonder if you're putting off people who might be your audience. Absolutely. Down, you know? Yes, I think so. Uh, <clears throat> but one has a responsibility to, to oneself. Um, it's easy for me to say, well, I'm bisexual, but I'm going to keep it a secret. Um, because I, to get it off my chest was such a great relief. And mm -hmm. most people in the business knew anyway. And it does offend people. And um, a lot of people don't understand, and I understand that. But it also helps a lot of people that are in situations that may be gay or bisexual, who are in little towns and places like that. If someone comes out, I can't stand people in show business that are out and out screaming queens that keep saying, Oh, I hate faggots, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't just celebrities. It was all these right. very, very interesting figures in American history that would sit down and talk to him about themselves. CIA agents and FBI guys and mob guys. But suffice to say that there came a time when you also made an arrangement with the KGB, told this to the CIA and operated as a double agent for a period of time. That's correct. There was also a moment in time where the KGB found out about your duplicity and a man came to visit you at your house. Could you tell me what happened on that occasion? There was a knock on the door and my ex-friend, that's hard to say, um, uh, professional assassin of the KGB, a drunkard, psychopath, who liked me. He really, he really <laughs> liked <Okay>. me. <laughs> and he came um, all in tears almost. He said, Boris, I have to tell you, 
we know what you are doing. And here he told me what they know, and they actually knew everything. He said, and I'm the guy who will come after your head. I have to kill you, and I will kill you. But you know, I like you. I will kill you very fast. Yeah, I thought that was so interesting on the show that you would get celebrities and you'd get musicians and athletes and then sometimes politicians, but then you would get, yeah, like you said, people talking just about topics. They would talk about smoking or you said divorce or alcoholism or I know they had a couple shows about LSD because that was new. Do you ever think about all the kids whose lives got messed up because maybe they listened to Timothy Leary? And I don't mean to get down or really philosophical mm -hmm. here, but a lot of young people saw you as a leader mm -hmm. and maybe you sent them down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, Doc? Well, uh, I regret any moment of pain that anyone suffered during the 60s, either by taking drugs or not taking drugs. Uh, you have to keep score on these things. Um, I believe that uh, LSD is the safest recreational thing around, safer than jogging or skiing. The government may have started the whole LSD experience for all the people that tried that stuff, since they were the ones that set up the experiments to begin with. Well, yeah, it's a, on, on a certain level. Maybe so. Maybe they made it available. But it was in the air. Uh, there was all those books out like Doors to Perception and all this. There was a tremendous curiosity about psychedelics, and there were some people who had, who even had, uh, who were able to get peyote buttons in those days, mm -hmm. before uh, manufactured LSD was around. And so the psychedelic experience was known in, you know, in certain circles. Do you feel that you may have hurt yourself at all from all the experiments or experiences that you've had? Just for <laughs> the sake of the record, I think that you don't get anything free. Everything bruises something, and, and uh, so you can, you trade off. Damon is a Michigan-based hypnotist who hypnotizes groups of people to rid themselves of all bad habits, especially eating too much and smoking at all. Jackie Rogers, the founder of Smoke Enders here in New York, we did something with this organization on the local news program. We're not talking about the real cause of smoking. While the past 10 years or 15 years, these people have been hypnotized into smoking. By what? Conditioned yeah. response. All right. They've been programmed. They're big brothers right? and sisters? Yes, they've been So what are we doing? Yes. You know what we're doing? We're de We're not hypnotizing them. We're de-hypnotizing them. We're convincing their subconscious that, hey, you don't have to smoke anymore, and you feel good because you don't smoke. The point that I learned when I did my research was that I discovered that, first of all, it was addictive. I wasn't weak-willed. It depends Hallelujah. on... It... Secondly, I didn't really enjoy the damn things. It was just I was so miserable without them. It seems like a really interesting time capsule of, of the decade. Things like Watergate and Vietnam. Isn't it true that water, uh, the Democratic Committee was broken into three different times, or is it, was it two times? I know of one occasion, and I think that that was on June the 17th of night. No, well, they'd been in before that time. Oh, I see. Yes, definitely. And they had to go back. And I don't think the right reason has come out why they even broke into it. Well, the because reason... Because why would it take five men to put a, a little gadget in a telephone? What was the reason? Well, I've been led to believe by the various accounts that the reason that they broke in there was to take a look at the files of the Democratic National Committee. If there's some other reason that you know about that I don't know I don't about. know. I've been trying to figure it out along with you. If you had been Attorney General when Richard Nixon was in office during the Watergate times, do you think you could have solved that problem? I think Nixon could have solved the problem, Tom. I or think, counseled him on how to solve it. I think the problem uh, could have been solved very easily by getting rid of the tapes. We have people dying every second in Vietnam today, and regardless of whether you feel we were right to be there, or I feel we were even more right to be there, or we should have gotten involved after the French in the first place, uh, what are we doing now? Ms. Tu has been shaking her head no here, and I, I think we should hear her Yes, response. I didn't see her shaking her no, head. No, well, that's... That... I don't want to be rude, but I think that your Please country be has been killing us with your kindness for two decades, and we really wish that you would stop. Another thing I thought was interesting was... Um... The travel shows, because some of the later, you know, late night talk shows would travel occasionally, like Letterman or Conan or whatever. And when your dad did a travel show, it seemed like, you know, he'd travel to Vietnam and talk to orphaned children of, sold, of U.S. soldiers in Vietnam, or he was traveling to Hawaii, or he, he went to Studio 54, and he went to lots of interesting places. It almost seemed like, you know, his, his news anchor sensibilities combined with his talk show host was, was really interesting. Just over to my right is what took the place of the steam locomotive, the diesel electric locomotive. Look for the old steamers, only in picture books now. They are no longer a part of mainline railroading in the United States. Yet it's a funny thing, as this train, the Blue Comet, came down through central Jersey on this bright December day, hundreds of people lining the right of way and waving to only a memory as she flashed by in smoke and fire and steam. 
all those people remembering the days when steam was king and the glory of the iron horse once upon a time a very long long time ago now through the magic of television recording facilities we have moved this program across town here in new york up in the upper east side to a place which is called maxwell's plum and sitting with me is a gentleman who is very much a part of the new york scene a gentleman who shares my opinion that sitting on bar stools is possibly not the best place to do television interviews but considering the alternatives we shall proceed may i introduce to you one of my new best friends whose name is ward kimball and this is his backyard <laughs> he's got a thousand feet of railroad track <laughs> And he's got every toy train that's ever been made. And he used to work for Walt Disney and he invented Jiminy Cricket and lots of other stuff. And he won Emmy Awards and Oscar Awards. And he's certifiable. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. The Tomorrow Show is on the air once again from London, England. This is show two. And tonight, for the first time ever, television comes to a discotheque here in London, which is called Tramp. This place opened about seven years ago. It's been running full steam ever since. And if one would like to see the beautiful people in London, I am told this is where one would come, if one could. There is only one bit of a problem. This is a private club. It's by membership only. And I'm told all the memberships are closed. And the only reason we got in here tonight is because we happen to have a friend who happens to have a membership. And the rest is a long story, which would only bore you. One of the most controversial interviews that he did was the interview that he did with Charles Manson. Nobody can talk to Manson. Tom Snyder's been trying to interview him for years. For the Federal Bureau of Investigation. At the time, that wasn't really something that he was about because it was very sensationalistic. The Charles Manson interview will probably provoke dismay, possibly fear, even some anger. I hope it provokes some thought. He really tried to st stick to his journalism in that interview and treat him as he would any other guest, albeit he was a serial killer sitting like this far away. Written accounts indicate that you told the authorities, don't let me out, I can't cope with the outside world. Do you have a recollection of that? And do uh, you and make do a and desperate plea out of something, man. There's no desperate plea out of it. I say, I, I can't you, handle I, the I, maniacs outside, I, let me back in. I, I didn't use the word desperate, that's your word, Charles. Yeah, well, your, your inflection and your voice tones were uh, implications there. He does confess in that interview. If you want to play that slowly for your viewers, it's all over YouTube, that interview with Charles Manson. He talks about, did you kill him? Did you kill him? And Tom steps on the answer. But what Charles Manson is really saying is he's basically admitting it because he's saying, well, that's like Je asking Jesse James if he robbed a train. So... <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it kind of flew by and, and dad went to the next question. Why don't you want to talk about it, Charles? Why don't you because want to? Because I'm an outlaw and I go so far and then that's all you know. And if you did... That's like asking Jesse James. And if, you and, it, and, and, if and, and, and if, as others have written yeah. and as others have testified and as the media has reported, you did that. Yeah. And you sent your friends back in to do the deed. Aren't you a oh, coward? My yeah. friends back in to do the terrible deed. I've, I'm obsessed with that interview because I just, like a lot of people, you know, was very affected by that whole scene and kind of went down the Charles Manson rabbit hole my own self. So oh, <laughs> seeing yeah. your dad interview the guy right? that scared in you. In the room with him. <laughs> yeah. What about, uh, what about Shay? What about him? Well, what about him? He got killed. Well, the word is you killed him. Word Ooh. is you stabbed him. What's oh, it feel word. Like? What does it feel like to kill somebody, word. Charles? Word is that you're an old woman. Word is you have turkey in the sky. Word is, I don't know what word is. Somebody else tell you that. I didn't tell you Did that. Did you kill Shay? Hell no. Did you cut uh, Hinman's ear off? Hell yes. Why'd you, why, how'd that feel when you cut his ear off? Uh, I felt bad Truth is fun, it. though. Isn't the truth fun now? When you yeah, can, Okay, sure, okay. Sure. You cut his ear off. What did it feel truth like? Fun? When, My goodness. What did it feel like <laughs> when you cut his ear off? Tell me about it. Come on. People sometimes said in the interview, he seems to have an angry tone, and he said, well, that's because I had to report the news on this for like years and years before this, so I was kind of hostile towards the man during the interview, so. Well, plus which he had Roger Ailes goading him on, who was a producer, trying to make a show of it so they'd get ratings. So that this was one of the first examples of ratings coming into play. So that's kind of interesting because that was one of the, most watched shows in the entire series. A word about what you might think was my belligerence with Manson. 
I lived in Los Angeles all during this trial. I still live there from time to time in a quiet neighborhood just across the canyon from where Sharon Tate and the others were murdered. At work by day, I broadcast the 6 o'clock news in Los Angeles, the whole story of the trial, the shaved heads, the car foreheads, the harangues and threats in the courtroom. And by night, I tried to assure my young daughter that, yes, even though the murder house was close by, Charles Manson and company were under lock and key and there would be no creepy crawlers in the night. You know, another category of people that Tom had on the show that we haven't really touched on yet is, I guess what I would call novelty acts. Probably people that you would only see on local television shows around the country and Tom would kind of pick and choose from them and put some of them onto the national stage. At the top of the hour this morning, uh, we introduced uh, what is called the cosmic beam of Francisco Lupica. This is a steel girder, a channel beam from uh, the bed of a semi-truck, and I have four of them here. I guess I will start on my right-hand side uh, with Mr. Ed Fitch, who identifies himself as a witch. He is a practitioner of both high and low magic. And my second guest is Mr. Isaac Bonowitz, who has a degree in magic, uh, in the occult sort of magic, not the, uh, not, not the card trick sort. I was about to identify you as a witch, and that would not be correct, would it? It's like saying that a Lutheran is not the same thing as a Methodist but they're both, both one variety of middle of the road. What you're saying to me, in essence, is that there are divisions within witchcraft, much the same as there are within Christianity or within Judaism. Or there are, Buddhism or any other Or any religion. other yes. major religion. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Mr. Bernard Gittleson, who is an expert on human biorhythm. He calls it a personal science that enables us all to chart our emotional, physical, and intellectual conditions on any given day. And part of my crusade is to get airlines not to fly pilots on their critical days. Of the last 12 major airplane crashes, 11 of the 12, either the pilot or the pilot and the co-pilot were on critical days. We have had more fun here today with uh, Eiffel Plasterer, who is Mr. Bubbles, who's with us tonight from Indiana. So I'm trying to blow a hot air bubble, and if I get that, it's... It'll, it'll float, right? Oh, look at, look at, look at, look at. Oh, you have to work for these look things. Look at that thing go. And now we have ah. a hot air bubble. Breatharianism is a philosophy that believes that the human body, when it's in perfect harmony with itself and nature, is a perfect breatharian. Now, all of the constituents that we need is taken from the air we breathe. And the fact is, there is only one thing that keeps the human body alive, and that is breathing. The food that we take is the same as any other thing we take into the body, as it becomes a habit. In other words, eating is an acquired habit, just like drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Well, does that mean that when a baby is born, you don't have to give it anything to eat, no milk or anything? No, that would only work if the mother was a breatharian. I don't think there's any such thing anymore as a, something called a local nut. There are fringe elements in this society. I don't want to put anybody on television then, and I'm certain you don't, who advocates radical revolution, overthrow of the government, or killing people, stuff like that. But for too long, we have been victimized by uh, the, uh, the public relations experts in this country. The flacks who come around and say, put this guy on because he's written a book, or let's put this man on because he speaks the government line or the television line. It's very important to give all elements of society a chance to speak. I think television was designed to let people talk to each other, and I think we're trying to do something like that. It was just about information. It wasn't about educating people. It was about giving information from which the viewer could then form their own opinion. That's really what right. he was yeah. about. And it seems to me anyway, today, the people that are on are telling us what we should think about the subjects that re they're reporting on, rather than just laying the information out there and letting the audience decide. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's his, that's his news background, is just report the facts and not give opinions unless you're doing an editorial, but mostly just report the facts. The media has failed in its responsibility, or, or the, at least the, where the motion pictures have really distorted the picture of Indian people. Uh, I think, uh, like the Wounded Knee incident, the press came out there, and the only thing they got out there was the pictures of, of weapons and, and this sort of thing. And I, I would like to challenge you also, Tom, to uh, come to the reservation and, and possibly do a show. Please come don't to, challenge me, but I would like you to invite oh, well, me. Oh, I'd like to invite you and in, in, in NBC. You know what I think you should wear this, my dear? 
I think you should wear that because you're I just like you had, Joseph Goebbels. You're you a propagandist. You're taking the law in your own and hands. You are making a hate campaign against women. You are trying to tell people that you know what's best for them and you, you don't even know what's best for yourself. Well, you don't know what's best for me and I don't want to be raped and murdered. Why are you taking the law you're in like your Theodore own hands? You're like Theodore Bundy. Why are you taking the law in your own hands, my dear? Because the law doesn't represent me and don't fondle me verbally, dear. Now, you notice when you read your statement, and I want to be on your side as much as on his side because I'm supposed to be a moderator. But when you read your statement, he didn't interrupt you. So I think that you ought to let him make his. And then if you want to have Adam, then I think <coughs> that's fair. It seemed like with Tom Snyder, you either loved him or hated him. And some people said, well, he was kind of seemed unprepared and he didn't ask a lot of questions. And it was sort of interesting that I s saw an uh, interview with him saying this is sort of a feature, not a flaw, where he said, you know, some interviewers just want to rattle off a bunch of questions and they don't really listen to what the guest is saying. They're just waiting for them to stop so they can ask the next question. And your dad said, this is not an interrogation, it's a conversation. So you don't necessarily want to go in with a hundred questions. You just want to start talking and just sort of see what comes up. So what did you think of his style? Do you think it sort of set him apart from other interviewers, other talking heads on TV or? Well, I mean, he's my dad, so I'm a little bit bias, but as a journalist sure. myself and having talked to many well-known and admired journalists, there hasn't been anyone since him that's been able to really pull that off. I mean, he had a style that was very unique and he made people feel extremely comfortable. Um, his empathy was, I believe, what really connected him with the audience because he truly cared not only about what the guest was saying, but about the audience and really tried to just be that fly on the wall that all the questions that he would ask would be questions that we would ask of that person if we were sitting there. So they didn't necessarily have something to plug or a book or a movie. And even in the case of like a Steven Spielberg or someone like that, that was famous for things in film, they would talk about other things than Jaws or Close Encounters. What kind of a young man were you? I mean, breaking plate glass windows and throwing bar fun. I'd be in jail if I were a movie maker. Yeah, but I mean, I'm sublimating right now. Were you a bad kid? I'm channeling it all. No, I wasn't a bad kid. It was just a period of time of you know, trying to be accepted by the older you know, rough kids on the block, I guess that was it. I was really not the aggressive leader. I was sort of the kid in the back of the pack who, if it didn't look kosher, I'd go home. The closest thing to a Tom Snyder today, I would say would be someone like Brian Williams. Brian Williams um, from the 11th hour, he's a lot like my dad. He's got that snarkiness and he really cared. And if you look at his sign off, the last sign off that he did, for 11th hour, he, he truly cares about the medium of journalism. The truth is I'm not a liberal or a conservative. I'm an institutionalist. I believe in this place and in my love of country, I yield to no one. But the darkness on the edge of town has spread to the main roads and highways and neighborhoods. It's now at the local bar and the bowling alley, at the school board and the grocery store. And it must be acknowledged and answered for. Not long after your dad's show started, uh, Saturday Night Live started, and then, of course, Dan Aykroyd was doing his famous impression of your dad. Welcome to the Tomorrow Show. So I don't know if that filtered down to you or if that was too young, if you were too young. I would think the high schools would probably be buzzing about th that kind of stuff, but you were probably not in high school yet, so. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and another thing to note is the average viewer for that show was a female of 24 years old. So... It wasn't really high school kids that were even up watching oh, okay. that. These were like college kids. Tonight we're looking into the bizarre world of, well, I might as well say it, topless and bottomless bars. <laughs> we talked about Dan Aykroyd's impression of your dad and then Harry Shearer did it also. And Harry Shearer nailed it. I mean, like, yeah. it's crazy good. <laughs> Let me say right here at the outset that we are very sorry about what happened on yesterday morning's program with Mrs. Uh, Stephen Bates of Fresno, California. Her husband wrote, uh, called our office this morning, and apparently she was watching the show. We had Yuri Geller, the famous uh, psychic, on the program. And uh, when Yuri started to go into his bit where he bends the silverware and, and, and fixes the broken stopwatches or whatever he does with his mind, uh, Mrs. Bates was apparently sitting too close to the television, and her pacemaker went bluey, and they had a pretty rough morning of it. What did you think of all the, or what did he think of all these impressions? Well, he used to say, Annie, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So he loved it. 
He absolutely loved it. He thought it was fantastic. And it also really identified him as someone that really was important in that moment. To be parodied on Saturday Night Live is probably one of the highest compliments one could be given, if you right. stop to think about it. Um, at that time, now they parody other people that maybe aren't so great, but. Tom Snyder, MD. Well, you're gonna make a lot of money out of this, right? You'll make a lot of money, he'll make a lot of money. I'll bet he threw the pants off the guy, and I know I'll make a bundle too because I'll do the operation for him. What the hell? The classic staple of The Tomorrow Show was that your dad always had a teddy bear on the set. The teddy bear was a stiff teddy bear. Uh, a viewer sent in the teddy bear because my dad was single and he was talking about sleeping alone. And the guest thought that he should have a companion to sleep with. So the teddy bear became a staple on the set. There were more than one teddy bear. Uh, the teddy bear started in 1974, 19, early 1975. We did a show here with prostitutes. And during the course of the show, um, I was asking my usual penetrating question. And one of the ladies answered back, and Mr. Snyder, who do you go to bed with? Which is a question I don't care to be asked. And I said, well, with my teddy bear, of course. I think we got 150 of them. There were several of them. One of them got taken away uh, when they were coming back in the country from, I can't remember where they were. One of the remote shots that they went on and they, they took the teddy bear away. Um, because they thought maybe there was something inside the teddy bear that wasn't there. <laughs> oh. oh, what was inside? I wonder. <laughs> the one that sits on this set now is a replica of the first one. The first one went with us to London in 1976 to a very fashionable discotheque where he was swiped by a member of the crowd. Uh, we never got him back. Ace Freely beat the crap out of that teddy bear in the interview. Um, I think Joe Strummer punches the teddy bear. What do you want to say? about the news. Uh, I don't think you made a lot of friends with that move, but so be it. No, the news. Um... What are you doing? He's ruining your teddy bear. I'm <laughs> trying to make him a space bear. <laughs> All right, that's... Space bear. The only space bear in captivity. I got him, he's captured. <laughs> Do you mind if I hold on to him? He's, he's... No, you can hold him as long as you like. Thank Just you. make certain that when you leave, he stays, <laughs> stays here. Okay. <laughs> okay. I've, I've heard, I've heard the horror stories about thefts, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Your dad became a pretty big celebrity, I think, off of this show. That's why I'm going to meet with Lauren Belasco. Well, what's he got to do with anything? I'm hoping that'll help me solve the murder. Watch Tom Snyder on The Tomorrow Show. You'll find out. Well, what time? One o'clock tonight. I think he was in consideration to be like the new NBC news anchor, and I think Tom Brokaw got it instead or something, but... That's right. During the Tomorrow years, he was just red hot, it seems like. He was. And, you know, when that show ended, David Letterman took over the time period. You all remember Tom. He, uh, I guess, came to a national attention first on the Tomorrow Show, which followed uh, Johnny Carson's Tonight Show on NBC. What a tremendous program this was, because in, in those days, you didn't have a thousand television channels. You had maybe four, maybe five if you were lucky. Yeah. And uh, this TV would not be on all night. It would sign off. And then here suddenly, uh, in the middle of the night, was Tom Snyder's program. And gosh, was that entertaining. Do you remember how great that show oh, was? Of course, yeah. When I was doing sure. the late night or the uh, the primetime show last year, there were stories in the paper for the last two months that, you know, that guy's out of there. And it's hard to read that in the paper and come in here and put a smile on your face for all the people that you work with. And I really didn't have any great way of handling it except to lock myself in the office and not talk to anybody for a while. W what do you do when all the chatter? You know? uh, it's, it's real difficult. Uh, there's one rule I, I keep trying to abide by. And unfortunately, I only get to it about 12% of the time. And that is... It's only television. Uh, we're not trying to help this country get to Neptune. Uh, <laughs> we're not doing cancer research. It's only television. Uh, and there's nothing sacred about television. I mean, uh, if the 40-year-odd history of commercial broadcasting has taught us one thing, it should be that there's nothing sacred uh, being transmitted uh, across this great land of ours. That was The Tomorrow Show, and then he did a show uh, right after us called The Late Late Show from 1995 to 1998. And this guy really was what television was all about. Whatever was going on, Tom was the entertainment. 
we're coming up on another anniversary in a couple years in 2025, which will be the 30th anniversary of the Late Late Show franchise. We couldn't not mention the fact that the Late Late time period was in fact started by Tom Snyder. He was the oh, first yeah. installed that formula. So shout out to him for that. Absolutely. Yeah. I look back uh, after eight and a half years on all the great moments that have happened here and all the things we have seen that have changed our lives over the last eight and a half years. For those of you watching, how long have you been a fan of Tom Snyder? Did you discover him in the 70s on TV or maybe even earlier on the news? Have you been a fan that long or did you watch one of the later shows, the CNBC show or Late Late Show or listen to his radio show or discover him on the internet? Or maybe this is the first time you've ever heard the name Tom Snyder. Um, we would love for you to drop us a line, leave a comment on the video, hit us up on social media. Well, it was wonderful to talk to you, Eric. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the videos that you've done on Dad. I've been a big fan of your channel, and this is Thank really you. special. Thank I'm much. super, super excited. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And I was just going to say that um, uh, it's true that this seems to be one of those shows that's almost lost to the sands of time, and I just hope that... Uh, you know, on its 50 year anniversary, I hope that we can remember the show. And uh, I know there's little pieces of it still out there. And, and whenever you find them, people seem to, you either get old timers that are like, I remember this when it was on. And then you get new people saying, I never heard of this, but this is so much better than what's on now. So I just thought it was important to sit down and, and celebrate, you know, 50 years of tomorrow's show and remember the show that, that it was. Now, as dad would say, and I'll leave you with this, Unless we remember our yesterdays, there will be no tomorrows.